Great. OK. It's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Marco, who's going to talk to us today a little bit about statistics. It should be no surprise, uh, Marco is a, uh, a, a data science consultant and one of the main organizers and, uh, of PyData, and I believe he's chairing PyData London this year. It's happening in about a month's time. Uh, a fantastic conference, so if you haven't got your ticket yet, uh, you should definitely consider that. Uh, it's not too far away now. So. With all of that, we'll uh, get started. Over to you, Marco. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, thanks for uh, joining me today. Uh, I just want to tell you there are three types of lies. There are lies, there are big lies, and there are statistics. <laughs> so as, um, as a starting point, uh, you can consider the following statement. In the Vatican City, there are 5.88 popes per square mile. <laughs> and the number is correct. You know, I'm not lying. Uh, I don't know much about the Vatican City per se, but uh, I kind of feel that something funny is going on here. <laughs> and that's the idea for the talk. Essentially, we are exposed to the use of uh, statistics in different ways in everyday life, and statistics can be used to uh, lie to us. So that's the topic of the talk. Uh, we're not going to talk about Python, even though we can do statistics in Python and advanced uh, statistical modeling, uh, but that's not the point. And the idea is that uh, you, as the uh, audience, simply want to be uh, kind of a better citizen. Uh, you have an interest in statistics. You don't have to have uh, any advanced uh, uh, kind of degree in uh, a PhD in statistics or in math. So that's the idea for today. I'm going to start with correlation. So as a simple definition, uh, correlation, if I give you a bit of an informal view first, uh, it's already in the name. A couple of things that are happening together, so two things that are connected somehow. A bit more formally, correlation also uh, gives you uh, some sort of strength between, uh, strength of the association between uh, two variables. Uh, it's easier to think about uh, linear correlation uh, when you are first getting into it. So in linear correlation, the idea is that uh, one variable is going up, the other variable is going up as well, and they kind of follow a line that would be a positive correlation, or if a variable is going up, the other goes down again uh, linearly. For example, to give you something a bit more concrete, uh, uh, when the temperature goes up, uh, we sell more ice cream. Makes sense, uh, nicer weather, uh, more uh, people are eating ice cream. Now, uh, you can see between ice cream and uh, temperature that there is a connection intuitively, it makes sense. But in the <clears throat> when you look at the bigger picture at, at all other possible examples of correlation, uh, you don't always uh, um, have a causation. You don't always have a cause and effect uh, connection between two variables. So uh, the phrase here, you will find it always uh, referred to uh, correlation does not imply causation. For example, talking again about ice cream, the more ice cream we sell, the more people uh, are dying, <laughs> drowning. So what is going on here? Uh, is ice cream really a serial killer? <laughs> There is something called the lurking variable. A lurking variable is uh, a variable that is sort of looking at us, but we don't see it. And uh, in the case of uh, our uh, uh, ice cream sales example, variable, the lurking variable, again, is temperature. So if the temperature goes up, more people um, go swimming, and therefore more people uh, potentially can die drowning. At the same time, also, more uh, uh, ice creams are being sold. So lurking variables is something that is there, but we all often uh, don't notice it, we forget about it, or we just ignore it. One more example of a lurking variable. Um, when there is a fire uh, incident, uh, the more firefighters you deploy, uh, the bigger the damage is. So you might say, well, let's deploy less firefighters so we keep the damage done. <laughs> the lurking variable in this case is the uh, severity of the incident. So when there is a big issue, more firefighters are deployed. But then, uh, you know, maybe uh, politicians, when they do cuts to public uh, services, they kind of look at the wrong variables. So when it comes to correlation and the uh, notion of uh, cause and effect, uh, uh, it's complicated. It could be that one is causing the other, the other way around. Uh, maybe there is a third variable involved. Uh, a and B together cause uh, C, or C is the cause of A and B or maybe there is a transitive uh, dependency, or maybe there is no dependency at all. So A and B simply correlate, but there is no connection. And just by looking at correlation, you know, you can't really say if you have causation or not. 
Just to give you a few more examples, a uh, number of movies where you see Nicolas Cage as an actor and uh, a <laughs> number of people uh, uh, dying in a, in a pool, falling into a pool. So those two variables correlate. So Nicolas Cage may be bringing bad luck. Uh, next, uh, the consumption of margarine, uh, also connected to violence. So murders by blunt object. Margarine makes you uh, kind of aggressive. <laughs> Now, easy to blame uh, Facebook for everything nowadays, but you know, if you look at the numbers, uh, more Facebook <laughs> users, uh, bigger problems for Greece, so the national uh, uh, debt of Greece uh, correlates with the number of users in uh, Facebook. Internet Explorer, and again, violent crime. <laughs> There's a nice correlation here. And uh, finally, one of my favorite, if you, go, uh, if you look at the uh, chocolate consumption per country and uh, the uh, number of Nobel Prizes per country, there's a nice linear correlation. So more chocolate means more Nobel Prizes. You see uh, kind of Switzerland off the chart over there. And you notice a couple of nice uh, uh, outliers. So there's Sweden um, having more Nobel Prizes than expected. Who knows why? And uh, Germany, for once, the Germans not very efficient. They consume more chocolate than they should uh, compared to the uh, number of Nobel Prizes. So there was a correlation. Next, I want to tell you what happens when you start slicing and dicing uh, your uh, data set. And uh, what could happen is something called the uh, Simpsons uh, paradox, which is a phenomenon firstly observed by someone uh, whose name is not Simpson. So Simpson paradox, uh, as a textbook example, I give you some numbers about the uh, graduate school admissions in the 70s uh, from Berkeley. You look at the total numbers, and you look at the uh, percentage of admissions. And essentially, it's fair to ask uh, whether there is some kind of uh, uh, gender bias. So the, the proportion of men is much higher compared to the proportion of women. So it's fair to ask the question. Then when you uh, start slicing and dicing your data, you break down uh, per department, for example. And you see a uh, different story. Looking at the uh, proportion of uh, admissions on the women column, uh, notice how for many, many departments, this proportion is much higher compared to the uh, men's column. The thing is, when you look at the uh, absolute numbers of applications, you see how men apply in big numbers for uh, some departments. And in those departments, they have uh, a uh, lower proportion of admissions. On the other side, uh, women apply in low numbers when they have a high proportion of admission. So there are a few interpretations here. Maybe uh, women apply in uh, big numbers for uh, departments that are more challenging, or the other way around, men apply in big numbers for uh, uh, departments that are kind of easier to get in. Essentially, what is the problem here? Uh, the problem is that if you have any kind of agenda, you can show one part of the, uh, of the story or the other. And uh, all these numbers are correct. They're just telling you a different story. So there was a Simpson uh, paradox. Something else I want to mention is a sampling bias. So what is sampling? First, uh, sampling is uh, something we have to do nowadays in the age of uh, big data. The idea is that we want to select a subset of data points of individuals from a bigger population with the idea of uh, making some estimate about the broader population. And we want, of course, uh, uh, a subset of individuals that is uh, representative of the whole population. What is bias? On the other side, bias, uh, uh, when we use bias in uh, everyday language, it has a bit of a negative connotation because we associate bias with uh, prejudice. Uh, maybe there is some cultural influence going on. But you know, in science, in statistics in particular, we talk about bias uh, in a neutral fashion. It's just a systematic error. So, when you put together sampling bias, we're talking about some kind of error that happened during uh, sampling. So you didn't sample correctly. You don't have a uh, representative subset of the population. As a classic example, a big headline uh, back in the 40s, Dewey defeats Truman. So that's Truman, President Truman, the day he was elected president. And he's waving uh, a newspaper with the, uh, which is stating the opposite story. So what happened here? The newspaper from uh, Chicago basically had to go uh, off uh, for the printer before they had the real numbers. And uh, they simply trusted some kind of a phone sur uh, survey that happened uh, in the previous uh, few days. 
But keep in mind this is 1948, so not everybody had a phone at home. And uh, when you look at uh, who can afford a phone, it's a specific subset of the population. So the people who picked up the phone to answer the phone survey, they were definitely not representative of the population in general. They were, uh, you know, kind of upper class, if you prefer, rich people at the time. And essentially, the uh, survey was giving the completely wrong picture. And that's what happens when uh, uh, you don't sample uh, with a, you don't get a representative subset when you sample incorrectly. A uh, particular case of uh, uh, sampling bias is also survivorship uh, bias. Survivorship bias is what happens when you focus on the lottery winner and you forget about uh, all the people who bought a lottery ticket without uh, um, winning the lottery. So if you remember from the keynote uh, this morning uh, when uh, um, Lucas mentioned, uh, uh, if I could do it, uh, then you can do it as well. That's a classic uh, uh, kind of survivorship bias. So <laughs> he went through explaining what happened, and he was very honest, saying, uh, well, when you are successful, always it's by chance. And a couple of things could happen, and uh, things can go in every sort of direction. But often, when you read uh, stories about uh, you know, what do successful people have in common, that's uh, you know, textbook survivorship bias. And if you look at successful people, if, we, uh, well, if, you, if you consider being a billionaire uh, uh, a variable, that determines your success. All these successful people, let's say Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Zuckerberg, and so on, are all college dropouts. So should you stop uh, uh, your studies? Should you quit uh, uh, college? The nice thing about survivorship bias is that it works in both directions. So I didn't drop out of college, and I didn't become a billionaire. So that's survivorship bias. Next topic, data visualization. Uh, why is data visualization important? Maybe you, you heard already the phrase, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. Essentially, the idea is that you can use uh, pictures to better convey insights on your data. And often, data visualization as a discipline will uh, give you insights that you don't have uh, uh, just by doing some uh, um, analysis on your data. Often, uh, we talk about summary statistics when we uh, look at uh, new data. Here we have a common example with uh, four different data sets, and they all have the same summary statistics. So if you pull uh, the average value for x and y, if you look at the standard deviation, if you look at the linear correlation, if you look at a few summary statistics, they are all the same. But then in the moment you plot the data, you will see a very different story. So that's why data visualization is important. You get insights that you wouldn't have otherwise. And you can use uh, data visualization for storytelling to convey kind of complex uh, um, topics in a simplified uh, fashion. For example, here there is a picture about uh, how different parties uh, kind of agree with some sort of core decision. And the picture is showing how the Democrats, is uh, based in the US, how the Democrats have a much, much higher proportion of agreement. And that's fine. But for some reason, the y-axis starts from 50 rather than starting from zero. So if you visualize the correct uh, chart, uh, the story is very different. Yes, the Democrats have a tiny uh, higher proportion compared to the other columns, but they're kind of in the same ballpark. So depending on how you want to convey the message, you can simply cheat and cut the y-axis. Again, from the US, uh, an example that is related to uh, gun violence, of course, big topic in the US. In 2005, in uh, Florida, they introduced a law called the Stand Your Ground Law. And they show that how, um, as soon as the law is introduced, there is kind of a drop in the chart of gun deaths. Again, look at the y-axis. It goes from uh, 1,000, and it goes up to 0. <laughs> so, if you fix it, on the right-hand side is the fixed version. Reality is literally upside down. Another example, this one is from the uh, Italian uh, public TV service, uh, the equivalent of the BBC, if you want. Uh, they have run a survey. The, they are asking, is the government friends with the lobby? Of course, being friends with the lobby is bad. So if you don't like the answer, 44% becomes a uh, tiny. <laughs> Uh, tiny slice. <laughs> Luckily, I don't pay a uh, TV license anymore in Italy. <laughs> so, yeah, I, when I was living there, I was thinking, well, we are um, kind of world champion at this uh, until I moved to the UK. <laughs> so this is from a few elections ago, a, a few leaflets um, from a variety of parties. There is no big red bus with uh, fake numbers on it. 
Uh, but look at the numbers. This is from the uh, conservatives. They're telling a story about how you shouldn't vote for the others, blah, blah, blah. According to the graphic designer of the uh, Tories, 42% is much smaller than 32%. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, the next one is from the Lib Dems. They are kind of close seconds. They are, you know, it's one of those messages, yes, yeah, go out and vote because we are close second and we need your vote to, to catch up. But then when you look at the uh, real chart, well, it's, they are second, but uh, not very close. And for completeness, one more. Uh, this one is from the Labour Party. And uh, in the UK, there's always this story about it's a race between two horses because first past, uh, first past the post system. And they say, you know, don't waste your vote on the third little guy. You have to vote for us. So it is a race of uh, two horses, uh, although they literally forgot uh, the second horse. Uh, that was the Green Party in, uh, in this particular constituency. So yeah, I tried to make it across different parties uh, to either to upset everybody or to make everybody happy. <laughs> Next, uh, I want to talk about significance, statistical significance, so a slightly more technical uh, topic. The um, issue with statistical significance is one of the most unfortunate uh, terms in statistics because in everyday life, uh, when we talk about something as uh, a significant event, uh, we also uh, consider it important. In uh, statistics, we don't really have uh, this idea of something significant being important as well. So when we look at statistically significant results, uh, essentially we are simply a little bit more sure that the results are reliable, that they are not by chance. It doesn't mean that the results are important. It doesn't mean that the results are big. It doesn't mean that the results are even useful for any kind of a decision process. Simply, we are a little bit more sure that they are not really random. But then, of course, when scientists report statistically significant results, then journalists can take the word significant and make a, a different story. Connected to the notion of uh, statistical significance, we have this uh, concept of p-values. Uh, it's one of those uh, concepts that you know, when I was a student, I couldn't figure out the meaning of p-values. And now, uh, many years later, I wish I could tell you that uh, I fully understand p-values, but I don't. <laughs> so I was trying to look it up, and uh, there is even a big uh, Wikipedia page of what the p-values are not. So if you don't understand p-values, you're not alone. So let's try to, s to uh, figure out what p-values are. Essentially, it's about probabilities, probabilities of observing our results when the null hypothesis is true. We're talking about probability, not certainty. And more importantly, typically in publications, in publications you will see a p-value set to some kind of arbitrary threshold that often is 0.05. Some fields are a little bit more strict. Others are a little bit more relaxed. Essentially, it's a probability about uh, being a little bit more sure that we, what we see is not randomness. It doesn't tell us uh, anything else. Related to the notion of p-values, we have a practice called uh, data dredging. Uh, that's dredging. When we talk about data dredging, also called uh, p-hacking or, uh, or data phishing, essentially we, um, we are looking for uh, significance before testing, before having any hypothesis. The convention should be we formulate some hypothesis, we collect data, and we prove or disprove the hypothesis. Uh, often people try to simply uh, brute force the data that they have and they look for something that is statistically significant and they come up with an hypothesis in retrospective. So the idea is if you're looking for patterns, you are uh, doing some exploratory analysis, that's fine, but testing the hypothesis on, backtesting your hypothesis on uh, the same data set is not because you are going to confirm what you already saw. And that's kind of like cheating. So there was a uh, Statistical significance, a slightly more technical uh, topic. Um, one more thing, a little bit of a bonus content. Celebrities on Twitter, this could be you know, a talk on its own, talk of many, many hours. You have cele celebrities uh, talking about uh, things they don't understand on Twitter and uh, coming up with uh, strong statements. And uh, you know, I could be lazy and pick up any kind of celebrity and I would find something. Here I went for... Uh, Bill Gates, who is doing a lot of work uh, nowadays uh, in terms of uh, um, charity and fighting uh, malaria and uh, a lot of uh, humanitarian uh, uh, work. And uh, talking about his work, uh, basically he's uh, uh, trying to make a point here about how 
mosquitoes are dangerous. Um, and uh, he's reporting uh, some numbers about number of people who die uh, when they encounter a shark. It's a relatively small number compared to deaths uh, uh, from mosquitoes. Those are raw numbers, and that's fine. Uh, the point is, well, again, uh, we're looking at numbers, but what is the cause? So the condition of probabilities are, of course, different. I never encounter a shark in my life, but I've encountered many, many mosquitoes. So you see the picture here is uh, reported as if uh, mosquitoes are terrible. Of course, they are the cause of malaria, and he's uh, focusing on that at the moment. Um, but the condition that we are looking at uh, is something completely dif different. So wrapping up, uh, uh, I gave you a few examples of uh, lies and big lies and uh, something done on purpose or something done by mistake. So it feels like we are screwed. Essentially, everybody lies. Now, the point of the talk is uh, not to make, uh, not to create like a new generation of uh, uh, conspiracists or, uh, or anything like that. The point of the talk is simply to uh, make clear that this kind of problems can happen to everybody. And uh, uh, we, as uh, citizens, uh, in, the, in the general case, and as specialized uh, users, some of us are data analysts, some of us are data scientists, uh, some of us may have uh, some kind of more formal training in statistics, other less. But the idea is that it's important to ask questions and to make a clear distinction between uh, what is good science versus you know, big, uh, uh, loud uh, headlines. And as I said, nobody is immune to this. It could happen uh, by mistake to everybody. Uh, so it's always important to ask questions. For example, what is the context? What is the bigger picture? Uh, who's paying for a particular study? Is there anything that is not being reported? Is there anything missing? And uh, all in all, you know, so what? You see some numbers, you see some statistics, so what? You should put things in a context. So that's the end for me. Um, thanks for stay, sticking around. I just want to mention, uh, uh, Alex uh, uh, mentioned it already, uh, I'm part of the organization committee for PyData London. So if you want to listen to people who know about statistics and data science and machine learning and data engineering and all the stuff, next month uh, we will be uh, down the, the road uh, near uh, Tower Bridge with a three-day conference. Thank you very much. We have two minutes for questions. You're close. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was great. That was really funny. Um, unfortunately, we live in a world where the, the truth doesn't matter as much as important people saying stuff. And you know, we have the benefit of being in this lovely room and listening to these cool talks. And there are millions of people not in this room listening to this cool talk who think, for example, that you know, 350 million pounds a week is a reasonable sounding number. Um, so what, what more can we do other than just be informed and just, just us knowing about this? Yeah, that's, that's a huge question. Um, so the opposite of ignorance is uh, probably education. So that's, that's my starting point. Uh, and of course, uh, money always wins against, <laughs> against education and good intention. So I don't have uh, any short-term or long-term plan, but um, I would say, yes, education and carry on with education is, is kind of the reasonable uh, uh, good citizenship uh, type of thing. Uh, in terms of uh, making big statements, then there is always the issue that um, there are parts of society that should be uh, held accountable by some other parts of society. So when there is a politician making a wrong statement, a wrong as in reporting wrong numbers uh, on purpose, there should be a journalist asking the question. Uh, it's not happening every time. It's happening less and less nowadays. And uh, with what we experience online, uh, uh, with the uh, freemium uh, model, so free content, uh, but uh, advertisement pay for it, uh, it's much easier to uh, publish uh, you know, extreme views, extreme, extreme con polarizing content, if you want, than it is to have a proper in-depth uh, uh, analysis on whatever issue uh, you're discussing, proposing mild views and suggestions. So yeah, it looks like we're screwed. <laughs>
another question. How can I get better at lying with statistics? Uh, yeah, that's not kind of the point of, uh, of my talk. <laughs> I guess it, yeah, if you have, uh, if you have an agenda, uh, you can always uh, twist the table and uh, propose uh, correct numbers that are uh, suggesting that your story is correct and uh, pretending to ignore uh, the numbers that are not uh, uh, supporting your, uh, your point. That's what people do all the time, right? Uh, so, is omission really a lie? Uh, well, it depends on the context again. I think you just need more Twitter followers. Yeah. Uh, thank fine. you very much, Marco. We're out of time for questions, but I'm sure the can uh, take them offline. Yeah. Can can carry on. Thank you very much. Thank you.